This is a recording of the presentation by Fiona Punter and Joanna Thompson of Goodwin Sands SOS that was delivered to the International Maritime and Shipwreck Society Annual Conference at Plymouth on 2nd of February 2019. It's now narrated by Joanna Thompson and was recorded at Deal Radio. This recording includes additional information not available at the time of the presentation. This presentation is about our story and experiences of our fight to preserve the Underwater Cultural Heritage, or UCH, of the Goodwin Sands, and importantly, our thoughts about what we perceive to be the failings in the current marine licensing process. Where exactly are the Goodwin Sands? The Goodwins, as they are known locally, are a 10 mile long sandbank lying three miles off the East Kent coast. Dover is just six miles away to the southwest. The proposed dredge zone is the area shown in blue on the right hand map. What makes the sands so special? The sands are special for a number of reasons. The first shipwreck was recorded in 1298 and some say 50,000 souls have drowned in their treacherous waters. According to Richard Larne OBE, about 3,500 ships have been wrecked on the sands, including nearly 100 that foundered on the night of the Great Storm of 1703. Many crashed military aircraft also lie in the Goodwins, as well as submarines from World War I. In the Second World War, during the Battle of Britain alone, 60 aircraft and their crew were lost here, including pilot officer Keith Gilman, pictured here on the left. He was one of Churchill's few and was lost on the sands just before this iconic image was published. The sands are also the haul-out or resting site for a colony of 500 seals, an important fishing ground and serve as a natural sea defence for the fast eroding East Kent foreshore. They also create the safe anchorage of the downs. The Goodwins are now a proposed marine conservation zone or MCZ. The sand Dover Harbour Board wants to dredge is actually one of two habitats designated for protection under the government's Blue Belt initiative. What is DWDR and why Goodwin Sand? Dover Western Docks Revival is the expansion of Dover's Western Docks to accommodate more crews and cargo ships. The development includes filling in two marinas to create more land, as shown by the red circle on the plan. The dredged sand is to be used for this landfill. At the time of the licence application and licence decision, this reclaimed land has no designated purpose. The buildings on the plan have been inserted by the architect and are not part of the current development. So why the Goodwins? As the ex-CEO of Dover Harbour Board told me rather smugly, well, we did it before. This is very true, but that was in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Legislation, policy and public awareness have changed substantially since then, as has our understanding of the cultural heritage within our marine environment. Dover Harbour Board says it's the most environmentally friendly option, but this actually refers to the dredger's CO2 emissions, not the marine environment. In fact, the new port development is going to raise CO2 emissions with increased vessel and lorry movements. They say they only want to take 0.22%, but in reality, this is 3 million of these aggregate bags, shown here at the bottom picture. But if they're stacked together, would reach the height of a three-storey house, the width of a football pitch, and stretch for 3.9 kilometres. It is not an unsubstantial amount. The real reason, of course, is it's the cheapest option, saving Dover Harbour Board an unsubstantiated £9 million of their budget, which, by the way, has rocketed from £120 million in 2016 to £250 million today. Environmental Statement The application required the submission of an Environmental Statement, or ES. This came in at a hefty 1,500 pages and was produced by Dover Harbour Board's consultants, Royal Hasconing DHV. An archaeological review of data was provided by Wessex Archaeology and the analysis of wave and tidal modelling and sedimentary processes by H.R. Wallingford. All these companies had worked together on the London Gateway project. The ES is not an independent document. It's commissioned and paid for by the developer and the contractors work within a small area of expertise. It appears to us that contractors might well be under pressure not to put obstacles in the way of their client, 
in order to produce the answer their client wants to hear. Royal Haskonian concluded that there would be no significant adverse residual impacts from the proposed dredging. A geophysical survey of the Goodwins done in 2015 identified just six anomalies in the proposed dredge zone, an area of about four square kilometres. Royal Haskonian analysed the impact on in situ heritage assets and isolated artefacts and concluded that with mitigation through design, the total impact would be reduced to minor adverse significance. They also analysed the impact of sand movement. Remember, the Goodwins are an exceptionally dynamic environment and concluded that the changes predicted would be negligible. Even for us amateurs, this was simply all too good to be true. In fact, it started alarm bells ringing and led to the creation of the SOS campaign. Wessex recommended avoidance of all anomalies, but no details were given as to how this would be achieved. Following pressure from stakeholders, 25 metre radius exclusion zones were proposed by Royal Hesconing, agreed with Dover Harbour Board and accepted by Historic England. Onboard observers are also to be present, but you know far better than us that once an asset is in the hopper head, it's too late to protect it and the integrity of the site has been destroyed. It's also proposed to have an onboard UXO observer who would potentially double up as an archaeological one and quite possibly a marine mammal one too. According to the environmental statement, staff will be trained in the identification of archaeological material. We don't consider this an acceptable way of protecting our UCH, especially compared to land-based developments where experienced archaeologists are permanently on site during any digging. A point of interest here, Dover Harbour Board only submitted their licence application four months before they were due to start dredging, when the normal time span for this process is two years. It does make us wonder if they'd been led to believe their application was a shoe in and the consultations were merely a formality. Following the presentation, Wessex Archaeology expressed concerns over how we'd portrayed their role in the consultation process. We've tried to discuss these concerns with them, but they are unable to speak to us without Dover Harbour Board's agreement. We look forward to speaking to them when this has been received. In the beginning, how did we get going? We created a Facebook page, which now has over 4,000 followers, and launched a website, goodwinsandssos.org. We started an online petition, which when we delivered it to number 10 Downing Street in October 2016, had attracted over 12,000 signatures. We received a reply that the issue would be dealt with by DEFRA. We badly needed publicity, a constant battle as the media is so fickle. We searched for celebrity endorsement and were lucky that Sir Mark Rylance, the actor, was interested as his great-grandfather had been a cross-channel ferry captain. This led to articles in local and national newspapers and magazines, local and national radio, and we've been on local and national TV news. As I mentioned at the presentation when we were in Plymouth, we spoke about Lewis Pugh, the endurance swimmer and son of Plymouth. He gave us a very welcome support during the long swim last summer when he swam from Land's End to Dover Harbour Ball. He spoke to Michael Gove and at the Conservative Party conference about the mockery of dredging in a proposed MCZ and described dredging around RAF graves as unconscionable. Unfortunately, it was too late for him to do anything, really, as it would have been unlawful to take the decision out of the MMO's hands at that stage. The weakest links. Of course, this is tongue-in-cheek, and for the benefit of those listening, we've omitted our lengthy dealings with Natural England and the Environment Agency. Our discussions with the statutory bodies and their advisers have been protracted, unsatisfactory and extraordinarily frustrating. For obvious reasons, we've only included the top-line issues, otherwise we'd be here all day. The bottom line. As you know, the Crown Estate owns the seabed out to the 12 nautical mile limit. We feel they need to take more responsibility for actions they allow on the seabed. For example, they granted Dover Harbour Board an exploration agreement which allowed them to carry out intrusive activities without considering the effect on UCH as required by the UK Marine Policy Statement. The only proviso the Crown Estate made was that if Dover Harbour Board hit anything, they must, as soon as practicable, report in writing to the Commissioners. When we challenged them on this, they simply said they left consideration of UCH to the MMO. 
we consider this unlawful delegation. A joint bee mapper, British Marine Aggregate Producers Association and Crown Estate Report from 2013, clearly states, With respect to air crash sites covered by the Protection of Military Remains Act, PMRA, no licence will be allowed if there are human remains present, the intention being that such remains be left in peace where they lie. Wessex identified the high likelihood for UCH being present, which by extension means there's also a high potential for human remains. But the Crown Estate have not satisfied themselves, nor anyone else, that no remains lie in the proposed dredge zone. In 2011, the Crown Estate submitted a response for the first MCZ designations that identified the South Goodwin Sandbank as a potential resource block of 738 million tonnes of aggregate, equivalent to 33 years of dredging. In 2015, for the recent MCZ submission, they reported that future dredging plans depend on the outcome of the Dover Harbour Board application. Over the course of the campaign, we've seen several articles about the world scarcity of sand, how the sand-hungry construction industry has exhausted land-based sources and is now looking for marine alternatives. It's therefore very clear to us that allowing the dredging to go ahead now will set a very dangerous precedent for future applications and could mean the end of the Goodwin Sands as we know them today. Historic England, better late than never. We'd like to clarify here that we corresponded with the Marine Planning Division of Historic England. We hope many of you have seen this poster drawn by Richard Larn. It shows why the Sands earned themselves the nickname the Ship Swallower. I also have a leaflet here from English Heritage about the wrecks of the Goodwin Sands, which is displayed in local tourist offices. Historic England's strapline is, we protect, champion and save places that define who we are. In 2015, Wessex undertook a case study of the Goodwin Sands commissioned by Historic England. The conclusions from this study were that the sands are archaeologically extraordinary on account of their holding the highest density of maritime heritage assets in UK waters and the highest density of protected wrecks in UK waters. These wrecks all have the reputation for being abnormally well preserved. So, with all this knowledge at hand and their remit, why, why did Historic England not a. object outright to the proposed dredging, B. Question a survey that showed up just six anomalies in a four square kilometre study area. And C. Allow Dover Harbour Board to convince them that the likelihood of finding unexpected assets was so low they didn't need to do a magnetometer survey. At the first two consultations, Historic England responded that the licence shouldn't be granted as they weren't satisfied with the information supplied by Dover Harbour Board. By contrast, the Nautical Archaeology Society stated... We can't think of anywhere more inappropriate within UK waters in which to conduct marine aggregate dredging operations. At the third consultation, Historic England finally manned up and recommended that the MMO didn't issue the licence as the risks to our underwater cultural heritage had not been adequately addressed. They also said they couldn't offer advice on the Written Scheme of Investigation, or WSI, as it hadn't been updated since the 2017 Magnetometer Survey. This was a very encouraging development, but Historic England completely ruined it when they backtracked a few months later by advising the MMO that if they were minded to grant a licence, the WSI should be included as a condition of it. So what happened? Had Historic England been leaned on? Were they afraid of budget cuts if they put obstacles in the way of the government's blue growth agenda? Making the WSI a condition of the licence is giving conflicting advice. Archaeologists are required by the MMO to make the WSI as part of their application. There appears to be a different, easier treatment here for developers compared to archaeologists. Also, by making the WSI a condition of a licence, it can't then be scrutinised by peer groups and stakeholders, and this is what has happened with the Dover Harbour Board application. Historic England now have the perfect opportunity to redeem themselves by setting rigorous conditions in the WSI. They must insist on visual identification of all the anomalies in the revised dredge zone and along the boundary, and impose effective exclusion zones. They must set a high benchmark for this and future applications in order to properly protect our UCH. 
We'd like to throw them the gauntlet to step up to the mark and save this place that defines who we are. At last, a proper survey. The red circles on the maps are magnetometer targets and the blue squares are sub-bottom pro profiler targets. Please raise your hand if you or your diving group have used a magnetometer to locate wrecks or dived a wreck located by one. So many of you, out of about 250 delegates, nearly half raised their hand. Interesting, isn't it, that neither the MMO nor Historic England required a magnetometer survey until we protested. How can you possibly survey for a major seabed development and not employ a tool routinely used by both commercial and recreational divers? We pressured Historic England for more than a year and finally they requested Dover Harbour Board to do a magnetometer survey. This was carried out in May 2017 by Clinton Marine. It took one whole month and the whole suite of repeat geophysical surveys was undertaken. 315 anomalies were now identified in the same area, up from only six previously. The dredge zone was moved eastwards to avoid the majority of them, but 29 are still left, including nine buried below the target dredge depth. This is despite Dover Harbour Board stating they would focus the dredging on an area free of anomalies. Wessex advised Royal Hesconing that the buried anomalies can be dredged over the top without direct impact, which we consider quite shocking although Historic England have now suggested that 25 metre exclusion zones are put around them, although this hasn't yet been finalised. Wessex interpreted all 315 anomalies as being of A2 archaeological interest. We asked Dover Harbour Board to provide the raw data from the survey, which they kindly did, and Pete Holt of 3H Consulting Limited analysed the anomalies left in the revised dredge zone. Pete identified four potential debris fields, including four possible A1 anomalies. One cluster of especial interest involves eight of the nine buried ones mentioned earlier. This demonstrates how different quality processing produces completely different interpretation of the same data. Historic England accepted the arbitrary 25 metre exclusion zones, but these would not protect a military aircraft crash site when one considers that the intact wingspan of a bomber is 30 metres. Canterbury Archaeology Trust have suggested a minimum of 50 metre exclusion zone and the Nautical Archaeology Society have recommended 100 metres. As a point of note here, we still haven't seen the raw data from the 2015 survey nor the Clinton survey report from May 2017. It would also be interesting to see Dover Harbour Board's original brief to Royal Hesconing. Wessex have stated that they haven't included all the anomalies identified by Clinton as some of them were analysed as being natural with a low magnetic signature. And you'll see how worrying this is in a moment. War Graves Both Historic England and Wessex are well aware of the presence of crashed military aircraft on the Goodwin Sands. In 2016, Wessex undertook a scoping study entitled Aircraft Crash Sites at Sea, commissioned by Historic England. This study identified the presence of such sites all along the south coast of England and up into the Goodwin Sands. However, no one appeared to alert Royal Hasconing to the high likelihood of making unexpected discoveries. Royal Hasconing's own experience from the London Gateway project, when a rare Junkers 88T reconnaissance plane was accidentally discovered by dredging, despite extensive geophysical surveys, should have made them more cautious. Royal Hasconing did not think to inform the Joint Casualty and Compassionate Centre about the dredging application, leaving Dover Harbour Board instead to make a misjudged attempt to contact the Commonwealth Wargraves Commission. Because Wargraves and the English Channel are outside their remit, CWGC didn't bother to reply, so Dover Harbour Board thought there was no problem. We asked Kent Battle of Britain Museum for help, identifying those who lost their lives in and over the sands during World War II. Over several months, they researched and compiled a list of nearly 60 planes and 80 aircrew from Britain, Poland and Germany listed as missing over the Goodwins during 1940 alone, including, of course, the Battle of Britain. We alerted the Joint Casualty and Compassionate Centre to the proposed dredge and sent them our list, which they verified with Air Historic of the RAF. JCCC then responded to the second consultation, objecting outright to the licence application. However, a change of personnel a year later led to a massive confusion of issues. 
They said they couldn't object until something specific was found. But when we did find something specific, they still didn't object and we are still awaiting a response. The Defence POW Stroke MIA Accounting Agency, or DAPA. It's not just the correct branch of the MOD who weren't contacted. The UK authorities have an agreement with the USA over activity in sensitive areas. Representatives and agencies working on behalf of the US government have dived the Goodwins in the past, as there are known American World War II bombers there, yet DAPA weren't alerted to the pending dredge. Yet again, we did this, and a joint dive venture is now being planned for 2019 to try and identify our bomber and locate some of the others. Can geophysical surveys reliably detect UCH? As we inferred previously, the London Gateway experience showed that geophysical surveys cannot reliably detect military aircraft crash sites. In August last year, we released this film of a bomber found by a local diver, and we'll show this video now. Using target coordinates we gave him from the 2017 magnetometer survey, our diver found and filmed this crash site in a single afternoon. A crash site which Wessex had analysed as being a seafloor disturbance and with a low magnetic signature. It lies in an area that has been surveyed not just once, but twice, but was never identified. It's abundantly clear that it's the quality of data interpretation that counts. The finding of our bomber has been downplayed by the UK authorities, the MOD, Historic England and more importantly the MMO who have dismissed it as only being in the buffer zone. They missed the point entirely. The fact that this one is in the buffer zone is absolutely irrelevant. The point is there are 29 similar anomalies in the dredge zone and no one knows what they are. The MMO states three times in the dredging licence report that there are no anomalies of archaeological interest in the dredge zone. But without Historic England insisting on ground truthing, how on earth can the MMO actually know that they have no interest? Any one of them could be a part of a ship or an aircraft. The Marine Management Organisation, the MMO. Where do we start? Statutory bodies, including the MMO, appear to be process-driven. It's all quantitative. A more qualitative approach doesn't seem to get a look in. There's a push-me-pull-you situation going on here between the government's blue belt and blue growth agendas. And it would seem that the latter is ahead at the moment, with seabed development winning over heritage and environment. The MMO have repeatedly stressed to us that their decisions are all evidence-based, as if this is a new business model. The MMO appears to take at face value evidence from its statutory advisers, but as we've shown, any evidence provided is only as good as the quality of its interpretation. As a stakeholder, input feels like being subjected to a box-ticking exercise, just so the MMO can say, if necessary, that the public were consulted. The MMO took eight months to publish the responses on the public register from the third consultation. In fact, it took so long we had to make FOI, Freedom of Information requests, to see them. The granting of the licence happened before the WSI was finalised and agreed upon with Historic England. How then can the MMO conclude that there was no risk to our underwater cultural heritage from dredging without knowing exactly what all the anomalies are, that the exclusion zones are appropriate, that qualified, independent, onboard archaeological observers are employed and make public the extent of the financial bond lodged by Dover Harbour Board to deal with any unexpected discoveries? This is operating at double standards. 
As we've already pointed out, the WSI needs to be in place before the decision is made for all applications. Allowing a WSI to be a condition of the licence for developers means it's not open for public scrutiny and is essentially a fait accompli. We'd still like to know what Trudy Wakelin, Director of Marine Licensing at the MMO, meant by her words to the then CEO of Dover Harbour Board at an unminuted meeting in July 2017 when she offered him comfort and reassurance that the MMO were ready and willing to listen and understand him. Trudy has consistently denied that it related to the dredging licence application, but has not confirmed what it did refer to. The MMO systems are, in short, shocking, antediluvian and a dinosaur. How can an interested member of the public be expected to download files of 380 megabytes every time they just want to read a document? Judicial Review. As you know, we lodged a claim for a Judicial Review, or JR, in October last year, and we are delighted that we have now been granted leave to proceed. It will be heard in the High Court in June 2019. This JR is being seen as a nationally important test case about the robustness of the marine licensing process in protecting our marine environment and underwater cultural heritage and the extent to which our statutory advisers are prepared to stand up against the economic blue growth agenda. We lodged the claim on two grounds. One, the process by which the MMO concluded that dredging would not hinder the conservation objectives of the PMCZ. In particular, that the MMO didn't consider the direct impact of removing the volume of 2 million cubic metres when doing their marine conservation zone assessment. Ground two, the process by which the MMO concluded that dredging would not pose a risk to underwater cultural heritage as the written scheme of investigation had not been finalised before they made their decision. The cost liability against the MMO was capped at £10,000 and it is interesting to note they've already spent more than this in responding to our claim. Slide 15. The system's broke and needs fixing. These are the failings we've identified within the marine licensing process. The MMO has no in-house knowledge of either our UCH or MCZs. It relies completely on advice provided by its statutory advisers, but does not question the quality of their evidence. The public consultations appear to be no more than a box-ticking exercise. We are very disappointed and feel extremely let down by the statutory advisers. Our experience shows they can't be relied upon to protect the nation's heritage and environment. They fear confrontation, there's lack of expertise in certain areas, they accept poor quality information and often have their own agendas. The environmental statement is not an independent document and there is no regulatory body for them. The consultant must take more responsibility for the quality of information provided by the contractors it employs. Surveys should be done at the exploration rather than the exploitation stage. A magnetometer survey should be included in all geophysical surveys as a matter of course. Positive identification of all anomalies should be prerequisite and appropriate exclusion zones can then be set. All raw data and documents relating to applications should be made publicly available promptly and before the licence decision is made. The WSI must be finalised and agreed before licence decisions are made for all applicants. There are several breaches of legislation here. The UK Marine Policy Statement, the Protection of Military Remains Act and the Annex to the UNESCO Convention and Valletta Convention where there is no confirmation of the extent of the required financial bond by Dover Harbour Board and where it's lodged. And finally, we feel the Crown Estate must take more responsibility for the actions of contractors working on the seabed. Looking to the future. Whatever happens in the short term, we want to secure the heritage and history of the Goodwin Sands for future generations. The aims of the Goodwin Sands Conservation Trust are to increase public awareness by setting up workshops and displays, both static and mobile. Ultimately, we want to have the sands listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, fundraising. Our lawyers are being very generous in their approach towards fees, but they do require us to continue fundraising for costs going forward. We need to raise at least another £35,000, 
which, considering what is at stake, we think is a fair price to pay. So please, dig into your pockets as deeply as you can. We are doing everything possible to raise funds, but we do still need your help to make this judicial review happen. Donations can be made online through the Crowd Justice link on our website, www.goodwinsandssos.org. Or, if you are a UK taxpayer and would like us to claim 20% gift aid on your donation, please contact us directly at goodwinsandssos at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Acknowledgements. We'd like to thank the following people for their invaluable support, practical advice and constant encouragement over the past nearly three years. We simply wouldn't have got this far without you. Thank you.